I don't normally talk about my job because it sounds like something out of a bad sci-fi movie, but I'm part of a specialized unit within the U.S. government that hunts down cryptids. Yeah, you heard that right. My name's Fletcher Rowan, and I've been doing this kind of work for long enough that the bazaar has become routine. Some people wake up, grab a coffee, and head to an office. I wake up, double-check my weaponry, and prepare to face things that shouldn't exist. But today, today was different. I was deployed to a secluded forest in northern Washington, near the edge of the Olympic Peninsula. Thick, ancient trees that seemed to hold the weight of countless secrets loomed over us as we trekked deeper into the woods. The air was thick, almost suffocating, and there was an unnatural stillness that immediately put everyone on edge. I was partnered with Jenkins, an old-timer in the unit who'd seen more than his fair share of things that would drive most men insane. He didn't talk much, but when he did, you listened. We also had two newer recruits, O'Hara and Lopez. Fresh faces, eager but nervous, their fingers twitching over their triggers like they knew something was coming but didn't know what. The intel we had was vague as usual. Local hikers had gone missing over the last couple of weeks, and there were reports of strange animal sightings, creatures that didn't match anything native to the area. Standard protocol was to assess, eliminate, and sanitize. We were supposed to leave no trace, both of the creature and of our presence. Easy enough on paper. We moved in a tight formation, eyes scanning the dense undergrowth, ears straining to catch the slightest sound. It was Lopez who spotted the first sign, a patch of earth that had been disturbed, claw marks gouging deep into the dirt. The tracks were large, too large for any known predator in these woods. Bear? O'Hara asked, his voice betraying the fear he was trying to mask. Jenkins shook his head, crouching down to get a better look. Bears don't leave tracks like these, he muttered. Too deep, too wide. Whatever this is, it's big. I knelt beside him, examining the tracks more closely. The prints were wide, almost feline in shape, but elongated, with deep indentations that suggested claws far longer than any cat. Cougar, maybe? But this... this is off. Cougars don't get this big. No way, Jenkins grunted. This thing's got a stride like it's running on two legs. That wasn't comforting. Not at all. We continued following the tracks, moving with a caution that bordered on paranoia. The trees closed in around us, and the light dimmed as the sky filled with thick clouds, casting the forest in a dim twilight. Every rustle, every snap of a twig underfoot set our nerves on edge. I could feel something watching us, something intelligent and malevolent. Then we found the first body, or what was left of it. It was strung up in the trees, disemboweled, its limbs twisted at unnatural angles. The stench hit us before we saw it, a cloying metallic odor mixed with the unmistakable scent of decay. O'Hara gagged, turning away to vomit, while Lopez just stared, wide-eyed and pale. Jenkins and I shared a glance. This wasn't just a kill, it was a display. Whatever did this wasn't just hunting, it was sending a message. Stay sharp, I warned, pulling my weapon closer. This thing knows we're here. We pushed on, the atmosphere growing increasingly oppressive. The forest seemed to swallow us whole, the trees closing ranks like they were trying to trap us. The tracks we were following disappeared, and we found ourselves in a small clearing, the ground covered in a thick layer of moss that muffled our footsteps. That's when we heard it a low, resonant hum that seemed to vibrate through the very air around us. It wasn't a sound any animal should make. It was too deliberate, too rhythmic. We froze, weapons raised, eyes scanning the tree line for any sign of movement. The hum grew louder, closer, and the ground began to tremble slightly beneath our feet. Jenkins motioned for us to fan out, but the moment we moved, it struck. It came from the trees a blur of muscle and fur, slamming into Lopez with the force of a freight train. He was dead before he even hit the ground, his neck snapped, his body crumpling like a rag doll. The thing moved so fast I barely got a glimpse of it, 
a massive, hunched figure covered in thick, matted fur, with a head that resembled a wolf, but was far too large, too wrong. Its eyes... Well, let's just say I didn't have time to look into them before it was gone, disappearing into the trees as quickly as it had appeared. Fall back! I shouted, trying to maintain some semblance of order as panic set in. O'Hara was trembling, his gun clutched to his chest like it was the only thing keeping him alive. Jenkins was already moving, laying down cover fire as we scrambled back toward the safety of the forest's edge. But the creature didn't retreat. It was toying with us, darting in and out of the trees, its growls echoing around us in a cacophony that made it impossible to tell where it was coming from. It was fast, impossibly fast, and every time it struck, it did so with brutal precision. Jenkins went down next, his body torn open by claws that ripped through his Kevlar vest like it was tissue paper. I saw his eyes go wide in shock before the light in them died, and then he was gone, dragged into the undergrowth by the beast. O'Hara and I kept running, firing blindly into the forest, but it was hopeless. The thing was toying with us, enjoying the chase. I could feel its breath on the back of my neck, smell the coppery tang of blood in the air, hear the crunch of bones underfoot. We burst out of the trees into another clearing, this one much larger, with a rocky outcrop that rose up like a jagged tooth against the sky. There was nowhere left to run. O'Hara was panting, his face slick with sweat, his eyes wild with fear. We're not going to make it, he gasped. Shut up and stay focused, I snapped, scanning the tree line for any sign of movement. But the creature was gone, for now. The clearing was deathly silent, the only sound the ragged breathing of the two of us. I felt a cold dread settle in the pit of my stomach. This thing wasn't just hunting us. It was corralling us, driving us into this open space where we were exposed and vulnerable. I heard a low growl behind me, so close that I could feel the heat of its breath, and before I could even turn, O'Hara was yanked off his feet and dragged into the underbrush, his screams echoing through the forest. I whirled around, my weapon drawn, but there was nothing there, just the rustling of leaves and the distant sound of something wet being torn apart. I knew then that I was alone. I backed up against the rocky outcrop, my mind racing. The creature was out there, waiting for me to make a move. It was smart, too smart for something that looked like a beast. I had to think, had to find a way to outmaneuver it, but the fear was clouding my thoughts. Then I remembered the grenade in my pack, a last resort option, meant for situations exactly like this one. I reached for it, my hands shaking, my breath coming in short, panicked bursts. Before I could pull it free, the creature emerged from the shadows. It was massive, towering over me, its fur bristling in the dim light. It was covered in blood, Jenkins's, O'Hara's, maybe even Lopez's, and its maw was lined with jagged yellow teeth, too large for its head. But it hesitated, just for a moment, and I saw something in those dark, hollow eyes. Intelligence, recognition. It was the briefest flicker, but it was enough. I pulled the pin on the grenade and held it out in front of me, my thumb on the release. Come on, you bastard, I muttered, more to myself than to the creature. Let's end this. It didn't move, just stood there, staring at me with those unblinking eyes. The tension stretched out between us, a taut, fragile thread that could snap at any moment. And then, without warning, it lunged. I threw the grenade as hard as I could, diving to the side as the explosion ripped through the air. The blast wave knocked me off my feet, and I hit the ground hard. The wind knocked out of me. For a moment, everything was silent. I lay there, dazed, my ears ringing, waiting for the creature to finish me off. But nothing happened. Slowly, I pushed myself up, every muscle in my body screaming in protest. The clearing was a mess of smoke and debris, and there, lying in the center of it, was the creature. Its body was twisted, broken, its fur singed and matted with blood. It was dead. I got to my feet, my legs trembling, and walked over to the creature. It was still, finally still, 
and as I looked down at it, I couldn't help but feel a strange sense of relief. I've been in the business of hunting cryptids for about 12 years now. The job isn't what you'd call glamorous, but it pays well, and it keeps the nightmares at bay. My name is Vincent Hale, and I work for a clandestine branch of the government. Think of us as the cleanup crew for things that shouldn't exist. You won't find our unit mentioned in any official documents or public records. We're the ones called in when the usual explanations don't hold water when the local authorities start getting nervous about what they've seen in the woods, or when someone's gone missing and the cops are whispering about curses and monsters. This particular job started out like most others, an urgent briefing in a cold, dimly lit room somewhere in the Midwest. The room smelled of old coffee and sweat, and the faces around the table were grim. No one had slept well in days. Our handler, a no-nonsense woman named Graves, was clicking through a series of grisly photos on the projector screen. Three people missing, one body found, she said, her voice clipped and efficient. Upstate New York, deep in the Adirondacks. Local PD is spooked, but they've been ordered to keep it quiet. Official story is a bear attack. I nodded along with the rest of the team, knowing full well that bear attack was the official explanation for a lot of things that had nothing to do with bears. My gut told me this was going to be one of those cases. The body that was found, Graves continued, was a hiker, 26 years old, male. He was found in a small clearing, about three miles from where he was last seen. Half of him, anyway. The other half was missing. Completely. And not in a way that makes sense. I leaned forward, studying the image of the mangled body on the screen. The guy looked like he'd been torn apart by something with incredible strength and no particular sense of mercy. The wounds weren't clean. This wasn't the work of a blade or an animal's teeth. It was as if something had wrenched the poor guy apart, like you'd pull the wings off a fly. There's more, Graves added, clicking to the next slide. This one showed an old, grainy photo of a town nestled in the woods. This is Raven's Hollow. It's a small, isolated community about ten miles from the scene. Population 85. They've lived there for generations. Most don't leave. Those who do, don't talk about what's out there. Raven's Hollow had a reputation. Even among people like us, it was the kind of place you heard about in rumors. A town where people didn't ask questions and didn't want outsiders poking around. Every few years, someone would go missing and the locals would close ranks. Most of us figured the town had some dark secret, maybe even a pact with something ancient. We were usually wrong, though. Not that it ever stopped us from thinking it. Our mission was straightforward. Find whatever was responsible for the deaths and make sure it didn't claim any more lives. Then, clean up the mess and make sure the official story stuck. We'd done it a hundred times before, but I couldn't shake the feeling that this one was different. There was something about that body the way it had been torn apart, something that wasn't sitting right with me. By the time we arrived at Raven's Hollow, it was late afternoon. The town was as eerie as I'd expected, with narrow, winding streets that seemed to twist and turn in on themselves. The houses were old, built from dark wood that had weathered decades of harsh winters. Most of them had their windows shuttered, and the few people we saw on the street hurried away as soon as they spotted us. We set up base in an abandoned hunting lodge about a mile out of town. The place was falling apart, but it had electricity, and more importantly, it was isolated. From there, we could stage our operation without attracting too much attention. Our team consisted of five people. Me, the team lead, Quinn, our tracker, Davis, our tech expert, and the newcomers, Ramos and Blake, both former military. I didn't know much about them, but Graves had assured me they were reliable. They didn't talk much, which suited me fine. The first night, we went into the woods where the body had been found. It was dark, with only the light from our flashlights cutting through the dense underbrush. The air was thick with the smell of pine and decaying leaves, and every snap of a twig made us jumpy. 
We weren't expecting to find anything. The thing we were hunting was smarter than to stick around its kill site, but we needed to get a feel for the area. As we pushed deeper into the woods, the atmosphere changed. It was subtle at first. A drop in temperature, a sudden silence that made your skin crawl. I stopped, holding up a hand to signal the others. We all listened, straining to hear anything in the oppressive quiet. Quinn, I whispered, what do you make of this? Quinn was crouched low, studying the ground with a look of concentration. There's something here, he murmured. Something that shouldn't be. He pointed to a patch of disturbed earth, where the undergrowth had been flattened as if something large had moved through. The pattern was odd, not like any animal track I'd seen before. It was more like a drag mark with deep furrows where something heavy had been pulled along. Whatever it is, Quinn said, it's big, and it's fast. I glanced around, suddenly feeling exposed. The trees pressed in close and the darkness felt like it was alive, shifting and moving just out of sight. Let's move, I said. We're not sticking around to find out if it's coming back. We returned to the lodge without incident, but the tension was palpable. Everyone was on edge, their eyes darting to the windows every time they heard a noise outside. Even Davis, who usually had his nose buried in his gadgets, was jumpy. The second night, things went bad. We'd split into two teams, Quinn and I heading back into the woods, while Davis, Ramos, and Blake stayed at the lodge to monitor the equipment. We were hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever it was we were hunting, maybe even track it back to its lair. It was just past midnight when we heard it, a deep, rumbling noise that seemed to come from all around us. It wasn't an animal sound. There was something unnatural about it, something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Quinn and I froze, our flashlights sweeping the trees. The noise came again, louder this time, and I realized with a start that it wasn't just one sound. It was a chorus, a low, resonant vibration that seemed to shake the very ground beneath us. We need to move, I said, keeping my voice low. Now. But before we could take another step, something massive burst out of the trees. It moved with blinding speed, a blur of muscle and sinew that slammed into Quinn, knocking him off his feet. I fired off a shot, but the thing was already gone, disappearing back into the shadows as quickly as it had appeared. I rushed to Quinn's side, but it was too late. He was dead, his body broken and twisted in a way that no human should ever be. I barely had time to register the horror before I heard the sound again, the deep, resonant hum that signaled the creature's return. I didn't think. I just ran. I ran like hell, crashing through the underbrush with no thought but to put as much distance between me and that thing as possible. I could hear it behind me, tearing through the trees, and I knew that if it caught me, I'd end up like Quinn. I don't know how I made it back to the lodge, but I did. I burst through the door, panting and wild-eyed to find Davis, Ramos, and Blake already on their feet, weapons drawn. It's out there, I gasped. Quinn's gone. There was no time for questions. The creature was close. I could hear it, feel it, like the pulse of a drumbeat getting faster and faster. We barricaded the door and windows, praying it would hold. The next few minutes were a blur of noise and terror. The creature slammed into the walls, shaking the entire lodge. It roared in frustration. No, not a roar, but a sound like grinding stone, like the earth itself was screaming. I fired blindly through the window, hearing the bullets ricochet off something hard, something that wasn't flesh. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. The silence was deafening. We waited guns trained on the door, but the creature didn't return. In the aftermath, we surveyed the damage. The lodge was in shambles, the door nearly off its hinges, the walls cracked and splintered, but there was no sign of the creature. No blood, no tracks, nothing to show that it had ever been there. Except for Quinn. His body lay in the woods, broken and mangled, a grim reminder of what we were up against. We left the next day. There was no point in staying. Our mission was a failure, and we knew better than to push our luck. 
Graves wasn't happy, but she understood. Sometimes you get the thing you're hunting, and sometimes it gets you. Back at headquarters, we filed our report, full of half-truths and omissions. We never spoke about what really happened, not even to each other. There was no need. We all knew that whatever was out there, in those dark, twisted woods, was something we were better off forgetting. As we packed up our gear and prepared to head out to our next assignment, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over, that the creature was still out there, waiting. But that's the thing about this job. You learn to live with the things you can't explain. You don't dwell on the ones that got away. You just move on to the next hunt and hope to hell that you don't become the prey. You know, most people assume that my line of work involves nothing but stomping through forests with guns and silver bullets. They imagine some ragtag group of tough guys taking down werewolves, vampires, or other things that go bump in the night. The truth is, this job is far more complicated and infinitely more terrifying than anyone could imagine. My name is Noah Holloway, and I'm part of a covert unit within the U.S. government that handles cryptid containment or, as most folks would call it, monster hunting. To get the obvious out of the way, I didn't grow up wanting to do this. I was an EMT in Portland for almost a decade, and I was good at it too. There's a calm you need to work in emergency medicine, and that calmness carried me through some gruesome scenes. A bus accident where half the passengers were dead before we got there. Gang violence leaving young kids dying on the pavement. But nothing and I mean nothing, prepared me for what I do now. You see, dead bodies and blood are one thing, but watching something tear a person apart like a chew toy, that's a different level of horror. This particular mission started as most of them do, with a terse briefing in a windowless room in D.C., stale coffee in hand, and our unit leader, Marcus Shaw, a former Navy SEAL with a permanent scowl, giving us the rundown. A small town in rural Montana had reported a series of disappearances. Now, disappearances themselves aren't usually our department. They happen all the time and get sorted by local law enforcement. But when a town of 300 people has 15 people go missing in a single week, and the bodies that are found are unrecognizable, that's when we get called in. The town was nestled deep in the Lolo National Forest, a place that didn't see much traffic except for the occasional hiker or hunter. On the drive-in, we passed a sign welcoming us to Jennings Creek, population 312. By the time we arrived, the number was already outdated. We were equipped, as usual, with the best gear available. Thermal imaging cameras, military-grade firearms, and tranquilizers strong enough to drop an elephant. Still, no amount of preparation could ease the tension that sat heavy in the air. There were five of us on this mission. Me, Shaw, a tech specialist named Jeff Carter who could rig explosives out of duct tape and a paper clip, Emily Rodriguez, our sharpshooter, and Tom Larson, a tracker with the eyes of a hawk. The first body we found was that of a local ranger, someone who had gone out to investigate strange noises the previous night and never came back. The state of his remains made my stomach churn. His torso had been ripped open, and parts of him were missing. Most unsettling of all were the tracks around him, not just large, but deeply imprinted into the ground, indicating something far heavier than any normal animal. Larson, with his encyclopedic knowledge of wildlife, had no idea what could have made those prints. This doesn't match anything, he muttered, tracing the outline of the tracks with a finger. I've never seen anything like it. Almost looks like a mix between a bear and... something else. We didn't have time to ponder what something else meant. The sun was setting, and we had to find the creature before it found someone else. We set up camp, keeping a tight perimeter and rotating shifts through the night. There was no sleep for any of us, just the tense silence of the forest, broken only by the occasional rustling of leaves. It wasn't until the early hours of the morning, when the fog began to roll in thick, that we first saw it. 
It was Carter on watch, and he whispered over the comms. Movement, 12 o'clock. We all turned in that direction, weapons at the ready. For a few moments, there was nothing but the mist shifting between the trees. Then, it stepped into view. To describe it as a single animal would be wrong. It was as if someone had taken parts from several different creatures and stitched them together. Its body was muscular, covered in coarse fur that bristled like a porcupine's quills. It moved with an awkward, jerky gait on four legs that bent at unnatural angles, more like a lizard's than a mammal's. Its head was the most disturbing feature, elongated, almost wolf-like, with a jaw that jutted out too far, filled with teeth that seemed too numerous to fit. It let out a sound, not a roar, but a deep, rumbling growl that sent vibrations through the ground. It felt like the noise was trying to crawl into our bones. The creature sniffed the air and turned its head toward us, revealing two beady eyes that glinted with something more than just animal instinct. Shaw didn't waste a second. Open fire! The crack of gunshots shattered the quiet. Emily's precision was unmatched, each bullet hitting the creature dead center. But instead of dropping, it barely flinched. It was fast, too. Faster than something its size had any right to be. Within seconds, it was charging at us, closing the distance with terrifying speed. I fired off a few rounds myself, aiming for its legs. One hit and the creature stumbled, letting out a pained yelp. But it wasn't enough to stop it. It lunged at Carter, who was too slow to react, its jaws snapping shut around his arm with a sickening crunch. The rest was a blur of chaos and adrenaline. Shaw tackled the creature, plunging a combat knife into its side while Larson circled behind, trying to get a clean shot at its head. Emily and I kept firing, but nothing seemed to put it down. Carter screamed in agony as the creature thrashed, trying to shake Shaw off. Then, out of sheer instinct, I grabbed one of the tranquilizer darts we had loaded for just this situation. I slammed it into the creature's neck, pushing down on the plunger until the entire dose was in its system. For a moment it stopped, as if confused. Then, slowly, its body began to sag. It let out a final choking noise before collapsing onto the ground, pinning Shaw beneath its massive weight. We dragged Shaw out from under it, and for a few agonizing seconds, none of us moved, barely able to believe that the thing was finally down. But we knew better than to assume it was dead. We restrained it with the heaviest chains we had, double-checking that the tranquilizer would keep it out long enough for extraction. Carter's arm was mangled beyond repair, but he was alive, and that was the most important thing. By the time the extraction team arrived, the fog had lifted, revealing the creature's full, grotesque form in the morning light. Even the hardened agents who came to retrieve it looked uneasy. Any idea what this thing is? One of them asked as they loaded the beast onto a reinforced truck. No clue, Shaw said, shaking his head. But it's something the world doesn't need to see. The creature's body was taken to a secure facility one of those places buried so deep in bureaucracy that even we weren't privy to its location. All we knew was that it wouldn't be coming back to haunt anyone in Jennings Creek or anywhere else. We packed up our gear, checked on Carter, and made sure everything was accounted for. The forest was quiet again, as if it had never been disturbed. But as we left the town, Passing by that sign that still read Population 312, I couldn't shake the feeling that this job was far from over. As I threw my bag into the back of our SUV, Larson patted me on the shoulder. Another day. Another monster. You did good out there. I nodded, not saying a word. We drove out of Jennings Creek, leaving behind the nightmare we'd just survived, knowing that tomorrow could bring another one. It started like any other job, with a knock on the door at an ungodly hour. I rolled out of bed, groggy and half-dressed, 
rubbing the sleep out of my eyes as I staggered to the door. You'd think after ten years in this line of work, I'd be used to it by now, but I wasn't. A man can't really get used to hunting down monsters for a living. It's just something you learn to tolerate, like bad coffee or cold showers. I swung the door open to find Clark standing there, his usually impassive face drawn into a tight line. Clark was a big guy, ex-military, the kind of man who spoke in monosyllables and let his fists do most of the talking. If he was at my door at this hour, it was something serious. Got a situation, he said, his voice a gravelly whisper. We're needed in Oregon. Oregon? I rubbed my stubbled chin. What the hell is in Oregon? Trouble, Clark replied, not one for elaboration. There's been a string of disappearances in the Cascade Mountains. People going missing on well-traveled trails. A ranger's been found torn to shreds. Torn to shreds? I echoed. By what? That's what we need to find out. I sighed, running a hand through my unruly hair. The last time we had dealt with something in the wilderness, it hadn't ended well. But that was the job. You didn't get to pick the assignments. You just did them. Clark turned on his heel and headed back to the black SUV idling in my driveway. I grabbed my duffel bag, hastily threw in some gear, and followed him out. We were wheels up within the hour, the darkened streets of Los Angeles quickly fading as we headed north. The early morning silence was broken only by the hum of the engine and the occasional grunt from Clark. We arrived in Oregon just as dawn was breaking the first rays of sunlight piercing through the thick canopy of the Cascades. The air was cool and crisp, a far cry from the smoggy heat of L.A. I breathed it in, trying to shake off the lingering fatigue. A local ranger named Dean was waiting for us at the trailhead, a weathered man in his fifties with a face that had seen too much. He looked at us with a mixture of relief and skepticism. You guys are the experts? Dean asked, eyeing our gear. Something like that, Clark replied curtly. What's the situation? Dean led us to the ranger station where a map of the area was spread out on a table. Five hikers have gone missing in the past two weeks, he said, pointing to various spots on the map. All of them were experienced, knew the area well. Last one was a ranger, good kid. We found what was left of him three days ago. Dean swallowed hard. Whatever it was... It wasn't a bear or a cougar. No animal does that kind of damage. Clark leaned over the map, his eyes narrowing. Where's the body? Dean hesitated. I've got it in cold storage. Wasn't sure what else to do with it. The sheriff? Well, he's out of his depth on this one. Show us, Clark ordered. Dean led us to a small outbuilding behind the station. The stench hit me as soon as the door opened a sickly sweet smell that turned my stomach. Inside, a metal table held what was left of the ranger. I'd seen plenty of mangled bodies in my time, but this... this was something else. The kid was barely recognizable, his torso ripped open, bones shattered, flesh shredded like it had gone through a meat grinder. But it wasn't the brutality that got to me. It was the precision. Whatever had done this had known exactly where to strike, how to kill with maximum efficiency. Jesus, I muttered, turning away. What the hell are we dealing with? Clark didn't respond immediately, his gaze fixed on the body. When he finally spoke, his voice was low and dangerous. Not sure yet, but it's not human. I didn't need him to tell me that. I'd seen enough in this job to know when we were up against something unnatural, something that didn't belong in our world. Dean looked like he was about to be sick. You think it's some kind of animal? No, Clark said flatly. Not an animal. That didn't leave many options. I exchanged a glance with Clark. He nodded, and I knew we were on the same page. Whatever this was, it wasn't something that could be explained away as a simple predator attack. This was something from the other side, something we were specifically trained to deal with. We'll need to set up a perimeter, Clark said, snapping back into mission mode. I want cameras, sensors, the works. We're going to find whatever did this and put it down. Dean just nodded, too shell-shocked to argue. 
he led us back to the main building, where we set up our gear. Clark was a master of logistics, and within an hour, we had the area wired up like a fortress. I set up the cameras, infrared sensors, and motion detectors, while Clark reviewed the footage from the past few days, searching for any sign of our quarry. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the forest, a heavy silence settled over the station, the kind that gets under your skin makes you feel like you're being watched. I could sense the tension in the air, the weight of something lurking just out of sight. We've got company, Clark muttered, staring at one of the monitors. I moved to his side, my eyes scanning the screen. There, in the upper corner something moved, too fast to make out clearly, but definitely there. It was large, bigger than any animal that should have been in these woods, and it moved with a purpose like it knew exactly where we were. Get ready, Clark said, reaching for his rifle. I did the same, checking the chamber, making sure everything was locked and loaded. The night deepened, the forest swallowing the last of the daylight. We huddled in the station, the only sound the low hum of the monitors and the occasional rustle of leaves outside. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat echoing in the stillness. Then it hit, a thunderous crash against the side of the building that rattled the windows and sent a jolt of adrenaline through my veins. Clark was on his feet in an instant, rifle at the ready. Stay close, he barked, moving toward the door. I followed, my grip tight on the weapon. We stepped out into the night, the cold air biting at our skin. The forest was eerily quiet, the usual sounds of wildlife conspicuously absent. And then I saw it, a shadow massive and hunched, slinking through the trees. Clark fired, the shot echoing through the woods. The creature barely flinched, its movements quick and calculated. It darted from tree to tree, never staying in one place long enough for us to get a good look. I fired a burst, the muzzle flash briefly illuminating the night. The thing let out a noise, not a scream, not a howl, but something in between, something that made my skin crawl. And then it charged. It moved faster than anything I'd ever seen, closing the distance in seconds. I barely had time to react before it was on me, a blur of claws and teeth. Not Clark yelled something, but I couldn't hear him over the blood rushing in my ears. I fired blindly, desperately, as the creature lunged. But it didn't go for me. It went for Clark, knocking him to the ground with a force that left me breathless. I scrambled to my feet, raising my rifle, but Clark was already on his back, wrestling with the thing. It was like nothing I'd ever seen, half wolf, half bear with a face that was almost human in its hatred. Clark roared, slamming the butt of his rifle into its head. The creature snarled, blood spraying from its maw as it snapped at his throat. I moved forward, the world narrowing to the space between me and Clark, me and the monster trying to tear him apart. I took aim breathing steady and fired. The bullet found its mark, striking the creature in the side. It reared back, a guttural noise ripping from its throat. No, not guttural. Something worse, something primal and ancient. Clark shoved it off him, scrambling back as I fired again. The creature staggered, blood dripping from its wounds. But it wasn't done. It looked at me, eyes filled with a malevolence that was almost human. I fired again, and this time the bullet caught it square in the chest. It fell, finally, a heavy thud against the earth. Clark and I stood there, breathing hard, staring at the lifeless body. I'd seen a lot of things in my time, but nothing like this. Nothing that felt so wrong. It's dead, I said, more to myself than to Clark. Yeah, Clark replied, his voice flat. It's dead. We didn't linger. We didn't talk about what had happened or what that thing was. We did our job securing the area, making sure the creature was really down. It was. Its body was still there, cold and heavy, a testament to the fact that this was real. As we packed up to leave, Dean approached, his face pale and drawn. What was that thing? Don't know, Clark replied. Don't care. It's over. Dean nodded though the fear in his eyes remained. I didn't blame him. It wasn't something you just shook off, 
but for us, it was just another day on the job. We loaded the body into the SUV, making sure to seal it tight. Clark drove in silence, the road stretching out before us like a black ribbon. We didn't need to talk. We'd done what we came to do. As we pulled away from the Cascade Mountains, the last remnants of night fading in the rearview mirror, I couldn't help but think that there would always be another monster. Another hunt. But for now, at least, we'd won. We drove on, leaving the horrors behind us for now. The first time I truly understood what it meant to face something beyond human comprehension was in the heart of Kentucky's Daniel Boone National Forest. My name is Caleb Taggart, and I work for a government unit so secretive that most people wouldn't believe it exists, even if I told them. I'm part of a team responsible for handling the things that go bump in the night. The monsters that most folks dismiss as mere legends or nightmares. It's not a glamorous job, but it's the only thing I've ever been good at. I didn't always do this kind of work. My early years were spent as a biology professor of all things. I taught students about the intricacies of ecosystems, the delicate balance of nature, and the peculiarities of animal behavior. It was a life that suited me, quiet, predictable, safe. That all changed when I lost my wife to a freak accident during a research trip to the Amazon. She was taken by something the locals called El Diablo de la Selva, a creature they described as part jaguar, part serpent. Of course, I didn't believe in such nonsense at the time. But when we found her body, half-eaten and discarded like a hunted animal, I knew something beyond natural explanation was at work. I quit teaching after that. The grief was unbearable. But more than that, I needed answers. My search led me down a dark path, one that eventually brought me to the attention of the people I work for now. They recognized my drive, my need to understand and they offered me a job. That's how I ended up here, deep in the forest, hunting something that most people couldn't even begin to imagine. We were called to the forest after a string of mysterious disappearances. Local authorities had found nothing. No bodies, no signs of struggle, nothing. The only thing they had were a few reports of strange noises, something between a howl and a screech, echoing through the trees at night. They called us in when their own investigators started going missing. That's when I knew we were dealing with something serious. The team was small, just three of us. There was me, Carter, who was our tech expert, and Myers, a former Navy SEAL with a knack for not dying in impossible situations. We were equipped with the usual. High-powered rifles, thermal imaging cameras, and enough surveillance gear to monitor every inch of the forest but we knew it wouldn't be enough. It never is. The forest was dense, a tangled mess of trees, underbrush, and rocks. The air was thick with the scent of moss and decaying leaves. The only sounds were the crunch of our boots on the forest floor and the occasional distant call of a bird. But as we pushed deeper into the wilderness, those calls faded away, leaving behind an oppressive silence. It was Myers who spotted the first sign, deep claw marks gouged into the trunk of a tree. They were fresh, the sap still oozing from the wounds in the bark. Whatever made them was large, far larger than any bear or mountain lion. We followed the marks, hoping they would lead us to our quarry. As we tracked the creature, the forest seemed to close in around us. The trees grew taller, their branches knitting together overhead, blocking out the light. It was as if the forest itself was conspiring to keep us from finding what we were looking for. The silence became more profound, the kind that presses in on your ears until you can hear your own heartbeat. And then we found the bodies. They were arranged in a small clearing, five of them, all torn apart in ways that defied explanation. Limbs were scattered, organs were missing, and the faces, what was left of them, were twisted in expressions of unimaginable terror. This wasn't just a kill, it was a message. Carter was the first to vomit. Meyer stood still, his eyes scanning the tree line, 
his hands gripping his rifle tight. I knelt beside one of the bodies, a young woman, and saw that her throat had been torn out by something with teeth larger than any I'd ever seen. Whatever did this was hunting for sport, not food. We didn't speak as we moved on. There was nothing to say. We knew what we were dealing with now, or at least we thought we did. Night fell quickly in the forest, and with it came the noises. At first they were distant, almost like the wind through the trees, but as the hours dragged on, they grew closer, more distinct. It was a series of shrieks, almost avian in nature, but with a depth that suggested something far larger. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and I knew we were being hunted. We set up camp in a small ravine, our backs to the rock wall, hoping it would give us some protection. The fire crackled weakly, offering little comfort against the encroaching darkness. We took turns keeping watch, but the noises persisted, growing louder, more insistent. It was as if the creature was toying with us, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Around midnight, Myers shook me awake. His face was pale, his eyes wide with fear, a look I'd never seen on him before. It's here, he whispered. I didn't need to ask what he meant. I could feel it too, a presence in the darkness, something watching us with cold, predatory eyes. We scanned the tree line with our thermal cameras, but they showed nothing. The creature was smart, staying out of sight, just beyond our reach. And then it struck. The attack was swift, almost too fast to comprehend. One moment we were scanning the darkness, the next, something enormous barreled into the camp, scattering our equipment and sending us flying. I heard Carter scream, a high-pitched, terrified sound, and then there was silence. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding, and saw the creature for the first time. It was massive, easily twelve feet tall, with a body covered in thick, matted fur. Its limbs were long and powerful, ending in hands that resembled those of a sloth, only with claws as long as my forearm. Its face was something out of a nightmare, a grotesque fusion of a baboon and a hyena, with jaws that could crush bone with ease. But it was the eyes that caught me off guard, cold, calculating, almost human in their intelligence. Before I could react, it lunged at Myers, who was already firing his rifle. The bullets hit their mark, but they barely slowed the creature down. It swiped at him with one of its massive claws, and Myers went down in a spray of blood. I don't remember firing my gun, but I must have because the next thing I knew, the creature was on top of me, its jaws snapping inches from my face. I kicked out, hitting it square in the chest, but it was like kicking a brick wall. It reared back, ready to strike again, when a shot rang out. The creature howled, a sound so piercing it made my ears bleed and turned to face Carter, who had somehow managed to get to his feet. He was holding the flare gun, his hands shaking. Before the creature could react, he fired. The flare struck it in the chest, and the creature recoiled, its fur catching fire. It thrashed wildly, trying to put out the flames, but the fire spread quickly, engulfing its entire body. The smell of burning flesh filled the air, and the creature let out one last, desperate shriek before collapsing to the ground dead. We didn't move for what felt like hours, just staring at the smoldering corpse in disbelief. Myers was gone, his body lying in a pool of blood, his face a mask of shock. Carter and I were the only ones left and neither of us had the energy to mourn. We dragged what was left of Myers back to the clearing where we'd found the other bodies. The creature's corpse was too large to move, so we left it there, a testament to what had happened. By the time the sun began to rise, the forest was silent again. We didn't speak as we hiked back to the rendezvous point. There was nothing left to say. The mission was over, the creature was dead, and Myers was gone. All we had left were the memories of that night. Memories that would never fade but would also never be spoken of again. When we reached the extraction point, the chopper was waiting. As we boarded, I took one last look at the forest, the place where we had faced something beyond human understanding, and then we were gone, leaving behind only the dead. The debriefing was short and to the point. The higher-ups didn't ask for details, they never do. 
All they cared about was whether the mission was successful, and in their eyes it was. But I knew better. We had won, but it had come at a cost. As I sat in my small apartment that night, nursing a bottle of whiskey, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over. The creature we had killed was just one of many, a small part of a much larger, darker world that most people would never know existed. And I was part of it now, whether I liked it or not. I drained the last of the whiskey and stared out the window at the city below. The lights of Louisville twinkled in the distance, a comforting reminder of normalcy. But I knew that somewhere out there, in the dark corners of the world, something was always waiting, always hunting. And one day, it would come for me too. I always figured I'd die in a place like this. Not in the open, surrounded by family, but deep in some godforsaken forest with nothing but the whisper of wind through the trees and the cold, unfeeling ground beneath me. Hell, I've spent more time out here in the wilds than I ever did in the city, so maybe it's fitting. My name's Darius Vaughn, and I've been a hunter for the better part of thirty years, though not the kind most folks are familiar with. My targets aren't deer or elk. No, what I hunt is far more dangerous and infinitely rarer. I've got a simple rule. Never go after something that won't kill you first. That's kept me alive this long. I work for a government unit so secret it doesn't even have a name. Or if it does, I was never privy to it. We're the kind of people who get sent in when the local authorities find something they can't explain. And they need it handled discreetly. Our job is to make sure the public never knows what really happened. Tonight, though, I'm out here alone, deep in the Ozark National Forest, tracking something that's been ripping campers apart for weeks. It started about a month ago. The first body was found by a couple of hikers who stumbled across a tent shredded to pieces. The people who were supposed to be in it? Well, they were scattered across a half-mile radius, bits of them hanging from trees and smeared across the rocks. Authorities called it a bear attack. I call bullshit. I've seen bear attacks, and they don't look like that. We got word through our usual channels, anonymous tip, the works, that this was something else. The kind of something that puts seasoned hunters on edge, makes them keep their guns loaded and their knives sharp. The others in my unit wanted to move in immediately, but I held back. I knew better. Whatever this thing was, it was smart, and it was watching. We had to wait for it to make the next move, and it did. Three more attacks, each worse than the last. Each time the bodies were found mutilated beyond recognition, strewn about like broken dolls. Whatever it was, it was playing with its prey. The last victim was a young guy, just out of college, trying to find himself in the wilderness. Well... Whatever was left of him was found in a shallow creek, his chest torn open, his organs missing. That's when I decided it was time to go in. So here I am, trudging through the underbrush, the darkness thick and suffocating around me. I've got my usual gear, a .50 caliber rifle, a hunting knife strapped to my leg, and a sidearm holstered at my waist. It's quiet, too quiet. The kind of quiet that makes your skin crawl, like the whole forest is holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. There's a smell in the air, faint but unmistakable. The stench of death. It clings to the back of my throat, making it hard to breathe. I crouch down, scanning the ground with my flashlight. Tracks. Large, clawed, too big to belong to any known predator in these parts. I trace the path they've left behind, leading deeper into the forest. As I follow... The smell grows stronger. My heart beats faster, adrenaline pumping through my veins. It's out there, somewhere close. I can feel it. I tighten my grip on the rifle, eyes darting left and right, searching the shadows for any sign of movement. Then I hear it, a rustling in the bushes, too deliberate to be the wind. I freeze, my finger hovering over the trigger. Silence. For a moment, I think I've imagined it, but then the sound comes again, closer this time. My mouth goes dry as I slowly turn, aiming the rifle in the direction of the noise. 
There, between the trees, I catch a glimpse of it. At first, it's just a shape, hulking and dark, blending in with the night. But then it steps forward, and I see it fully for the first time. My breath catches in my throat. The creature is massive, standing easily over eight feet tall, covered in matted fur that looks almost black in the dim light. Its body is twisted, almost human-like, but with a hunched back and limbs that seem too long, too wrong. Its head is what sends a chill down my spine. A grotesque mixture of bear and wolf, with a muzzle full of jagged teeth and small, beady eyes that reflect the light like cold, dead glass. It stares at me, unblinking, as if sizing me up. I've hunted some of the most dangerous cryptids in existence, but this, this is something else. I've never seen anything like it, and I can feel fear creeping up my spine, threatening to paralyze me. But I can't let it. Not now. I raise the rifle and fire. The shot echoes through the forest, but the creature barely flinches. It snarls, a deep rumbling sound that vibrates through the ground beneath my feet, and charges. I fire again, this time aiming for its chest. The bullet strikes home, but the creature doesn't slow. Panic rises in me as I fumble to reload, but it's too fast. Before I can react, it's on me. I'm knocked to the ground, the rifle torn from my hands. The creature looms over me, its hot breath washing over my face, smelling of rotting meat and blood. I reach for the knife at my leg, but it swats my hand away like I'm nothing more than an insect. For a split second, I think this is it. This is where it ends. But then, out of nowhere, a deafening roar splits the air, not from the creature, but from a shotgun blast that rips through the night. The beast recoils, howling in pain as it staggers back, blood spraying from a gaping wound in its side. I roll to my feet, grabbing my knife and plunging it into its throat with all the strength I can muster. The creature thrashes, its claws raking across my chest, tearing through flesh and muscle. I scream, but I don't let go. I drive the blade deeper until I feel it hit bone. The creature lets out one last blood-curdling cry before it collapses to the ground, twitching and convulsing as life drains from its body. I collapse beside it, breathing hard, blood pouring from the gashes in my chest. I'm barely conscious when I see a pair of boots step into view. A hand reaches down, and I'm hauled to my feet. Darius, a voice says, gruff and familiar. It's Jack Reynolds, my partner, who I hadn't even realized was out here with me. Thought you might need some backup. Damn good timing, I managed to grunt, clutching my bleeding chest. Yeah, well, I don't like doing your paperwork, Jack says with a grim smile. He glances at the creature, still lying dead on the ground, its blood pooling around it. What the hell is that thing? I don't know, I admit, but it's dead. We stand there for a moment, staring at the beast that nearly killed me. It's not the first time I've faced something like this, but it's the first time I've felt so outmatched. Whatever this thing was, it was stronger, faster, and more dangerous than anything I've ever encountered. But it's over now. It's done. Jack helps me back to the truck and we drive in silence, leaving the forest behind. As we reach the edge of the trees, I take one last look back. The body of the creature is still there, a dark shape against the ground. A reminder that there are things in this world that defy explanation. Let's get you patched up, Jack says, breaking the silence. I nod but my mind is still on that thing in the woods. Whatever it was, it's dead now. That's all that matters. The night is quiet again, and as we drive away, I can't help but feel a strange sense of satisfaction. The hunt is over. The beast is slain. And for now, that's enough. I was standing in the middle of a dense, overgrown forest in western Oregon, trying to figure out how the hell I ended up there. When I was younger, I spent a lot of time in places like this, trekking through the wilderness with my uncle who used to work as a forest ranger. He taught me to appreciate the quiet danger of the wild. 
I guess that's what made me good at my job now. Hunting things that most people never even realized existed. My name is Travis Fenwick, and I'm part of a specialized unit that operates under the radar, far from the eyes of the public. You wouldn't find any official records on us. We're the sort of ghosts that only exist in whispers among those who've seen what hides in the darkest corners of the world. We deal with cryptids, those creatures of myth and legend that aren't supposed to be real but are. And they're dangerous. Today, I was on a mission that had gone from bad to worse in a matter of hours. It started like any other assignment. A remote area, an old report of missing people, strange sightings, and a lot of speculation from locals. This time, it was in the Tillamook State Forest, a vast, untamed wilderness known for its beauty and mystery. But that's not why I was here. Reports had been coming in about something tearing through campsites, leaving nothing but blood and bones behind. Some said it was a bear, others whispered about a wolf bigger than a man. But the truth was worse, much worse. My team was small, just four of us. Myself, Hank, an ex-Marine with a knack for explosives, Sarah, our tracker who could follow a trail through a hurricane, and Chris, our tech guy, quiet but sharp as a blade. We were the best at what we did, and we'd taken down creatures that most people only heard about in ghost stories. But this time, something felt off. The forest was too quiet, the air too thick. It was like the woods themselves were holding their breath, waiting. We split up to cover more ground, each of us equipped with enough firepower to level a small building. But even as we moved, I could feel it watching us. You learn to sense these things after a while, a cold dread that starts in your gut and spreads out, tightening around your chest like a vice. Whatever was out here wasn't just an animal. It was smart, predatory. I found the first body at the edge of a clearing, or what was left of it. Hank had been seasoned, seen combat in the worst places on Earth. But what had happened to him? It wasn't quick. His body was torn open, ribs cracked like kindling, entrails strewn across the ground. But what was most unsettling was the look on his face, a mix of terror and disbelief, frozen forever in his lifeless eyes. I forced myself to move on keeping low and quiet, my senses on high alert. I had to find Sarah and Chris. We had rules in place, protocols for when things went wrong. But this, this was beyond wrong. It was like the forest was swallowing us, one by one. I reached for my radio, static crackling on the other end. Sarah, Chris, report, I whispered, hoping for anything. Chris here. I'm at the ridge, can't find Sarah. Hank's... Hank's gone, isn't he? The despair in his voice was enough to tell me he knew what I'd found. Stay put. I'm heading to you. I moved through the underbrush, every step careful, deliberate. The wind picked up, carrying a stench that made my stomach turn, rot and decay like something long dead. I knew what that smell meant, and it wasn't good. When I got to the ridge, Chris was already waiting, pale and wide-eyed. What the hell is this, Trav? This isn't like anything we've faced before. He was right. This wasn't some beast acting on instinct. It was something that hunted us, and it was enjoying it. We're dealing with something smarter, I said, keeping my voice steady. It's picking us off, one by one. We need to find Sarah, get her back, and regroup. But before we could move, there was a rustling in the bushes, followed by a low, rumbling sound that seemed to vibrate through the ground. Chris and I froze, weapons raised. The thing emerged from the shadows, and I could see why the locals had called it a wolf. It was massive, easily the size of a small car, with a body that was more muscle than anything else. Its fur was matted, covered in what looked like dried blood, but it wasn't just its size that made my blood run cold. It was its eyes, burning with an intelligence that no animal should possess. This was no ordinary creature. It was something else, something ancient. Chris reacted first, firing off a shot that hit the creature square in the chest. But it didn't even flinch. It lunged at him with impossible speed, jaws snapping shut around his arm before I could do anything. 
The scream that came out of Chris was something I'll never forget. Pure, unfiltered agony. I aimed and fired, my bullets tearing through its thick hide, but it was like trying to stop a tank with a slingshot. The thing tore Chris apart before turning its gaze on me, blood dripping from its maw. I didn't think. I just ran. Adrenaline coursed through me as I crashed through the underbrush, my only goal to get away, to survive. But it was faster. I could hear it behind me, the ground shaking with each step. I knew I couldn't outrun it, so I had to outsmart it. I spotted an old ravine up ahead, overgrown with vines and moss. If I could get it to follow me there, I might have a chance. I changed direction, heading straight for it, praying that it would be enough. The ravine was deeper than I expected, and I nearly lost my footing as I skidded to a stop at the edge. I turned just in time to see the creature charging at me, eyes locked on mine. At the last second, I threw myself to the side, hoping it would be too late for it to stop. It was. The thing went over the edge, its massive body crashing through the underbrush and down into the darkness below. I lay there, gasping for breath, waiting for the sound of it climbing back up, but it never came. I crawled to the edge, peering over. It was there, impaled on a jagged branch, its body twisted in a way that no living thing could survive. Blood pooled around it, soaking into the earth. And just like that, it was over. I didn't stay long after that. I radioed for extraction, made my way back to where the chopper would pick me up. I didn't think about Hank or Chris or Sarah, though I knew their fates. All I focused on was getting out, alive. As the helicopter lifted me out of the forest, I looked down at the trees below, now just a sea of green. Somewhere down there, that thing's body would remain, a reminder of what lurked in the shadows. I knew I'd be back out here again someday, hunting another nightmare. But for now, I was just glad to be getting the hell out of there. We found Sarah's body two days later, what was left of it anyway. She'd put up a fight, but in the end it hadn't been enough. The only solace I had was that the creature wouldn't be claiming any more lives. And that was that. I don't look back on what happened in those woods. There's no point. We do our job and we move on. I grew up in the flatlands of West Texas, where the biggest threats were rattlesnakes and the odd, rabid coyote. I never imagined that life could get stranger, let alone deadlier, until I was recruited into the unit. Not just any unit, the kind that operates under a budget that doesn't officially exist, tasked with hunting things that most people think are just urban legends. And I've seen plenty to know that the myths people scoff at are the ones most likely to kill you. My name is Reed Davison. Before joining the unit, I was a wildlife biologist working in Alaska, studying the migratory patterns of caribou. It was a straightforward job, at least until a survey took me too far into the tundra, and I came back with tales of a creature that no textbook had ever described. The things I saw up there defied logic and biology, and maybe that's why they picked me, because I knew how to keep my mouth shut and didn't go blabbing to the press about monsters that shouldn't exist. Now, I track creatures of a different kind. Dangerous, predatory, not like anything in this world. The call came in the dead of night, waking me from the first decent sleep I'd had in weeks. The unit is based in Denver, but we operate across the entire country, dropping into places where strange deaths and disappearances aren't so easily explained. This time, it was a small town called Red Creek in West Virginia. Population, barely a thousand. The locals were reporting mutilated livestock, missing pets, and then finally, people who wandered too close to the woods and never came back. Whatever it was, it wasn't shy. By the time our chopper landed, the town was on edge. You could feel it. Eyes peeking out from behind curtains, the tension of folks who knew something was wrong but were too scared to talk about it. We set up a temporary base of operations in an old logging cabin at the edge of town, away from prying eyes. The briefing was quick and dirty, 
No one had any idea what we were up against. The attacks happened at night, deep in the surrounding forest. The bodies that had been recovered were torn to shreds, far beyond what any bear or mountain lion could do. The local sheriff's department had already written it off as a rogue animal, but we knew better. Our team was small, just six of us, each with our own specialized skill set. My job was to track the thing, whatever it was, and figure out where it came from and where it was going next. The others handled the heavy weapons, tech, and the grisly task of cleaning up after our encounters. We'd faced down everything from mutated wolves in the Rockies to giant reptiles in the Everglades, but nothing had prepared us for what we'd find in Red Creek. The first night, we scouted the woods. The place was dense, the kind of forest where the canopy is so thick that it blocks out the moonlight, leaving everything in pitch blackness. It wasn't long before we found the first sign, deep gouges in the trees, as if something with claws the size of kitchen knives had been marking its territory. No ordinary animal, not by a long shot. I followed the tracks, trying to get a sense of the creature's size and weight. It moved fast and low to the ground, but with a heaviness that suggested muscle and power, more like a big cat than a bear. By dawn, we had a rough idea of its hunting ground, a wide swath of forest that included several old mining tunnels. The locals had abandoned the mines decades ago, but we figured that's where the creature was holed up during the day. It was smart. Most predators are, especially the ones that are half as old as the mountains they live in. The plan was simple. Lure it out at night, track it to its den, and put it down. Nothing too fancy, just what we were trained to do. But that night, things didn't go according to plan. We set up our ambush at a narrow ravine where the tracks were freshest. A few goats, borrowed from a local farmer, were tied up as bait. It didn't take long for the creature to show itself. We heard it first, a low, rumbling sound, almost like purring, but far too deep for any cat. Then it appeared at the edge of the ravine, and everything about it defied explanation. It was massive, easily nine feet long from nose to tail, with a thick, sinewy body covered in bristling fur that looked almost metallic in the moonlight. Its legs were short but powerful, ending in claws that glinted like polished steel. The head was the worst part, a wide, flattened skull with a maw that seemed too large for its face, lined with jagged teeth like a shark's. Its eyes, which I didn't dare look directly into, flickered with an unnatural light, like bioluminescence in a deep-sea fish. It moved with a speed that was impossible for something its size. One moment it was at the edge of the ravine, the next it was on us. We opened fire, but the bullets barely slowed it down. It was like trying to take down a tank with a BB gun. It hit one of our guys, Logan, first, caught him across the chest with those claws. The force of the blow sent him flying into the trees, where he hit a trunk with a sickening crack. By the time we regrouped, the creature had vanished into the shadows, leaving behind only the mangled remains of Logan and a trail of blood that led deeper into the forest. We had no choice but to follow. I was leading the way, tracking the blood and the broken branches it left in its wake. My heart was pounding, but my mind was clear. This thing was a killer, and it wasn't going to stop until we put it down. But the deeper we went, the more I felt like we were the ones being hunted. Every now and then, I'd catch a glimpse of movement in the trees, just at the edge of my vision. But when I turned to look, there was nothing there. We found the entrance to the mine just before dawn. The place reeked of decay, the air thick with the smell of rot. The creature had gone to ground, probably waiting for us to make the first move. We set up a perimeter, checked our gear, and went in. The tunnels were narrow and winding, the kind of place where you could get lost for days if you didn't know your way. The creature's lair wasn't far inside, a wide cavern that was littered with bones, some of them animal, some of them unmistakably human. And then, it attacked. This time, it came from above, dropping down from the ceiling of the cavern like a spider. 
We fought it with everything we had. Guns, knives, even our bare hands when it got too close. It was like trying to wrestle with a locomotive. I remember slashing at it with my combat knife, feeling the blade bite into its flesh, but it was like cutting into solid rock. The creature roared in pain, a sound that shook the very walls of the mine, and then it was on me. It knocked the wind out of me, and I felt those claws rake across my side, tearing through flesh and bone. I fell to the ground, everything going black around the edges. But I wasn't dead. Not yet. Somehow, I managed to roll out of the way as it lunged for the killing blow. I heard the crack of a rifle shot, saw the creature stagger as a bullet tore through its skull, splattering dark blood across the cavern floor. It thrashed for a moment, then collapsed in a heap, twitching and bleeding out in front of me. The others moved in, finishing it off with a barrage of gunfire until it lay still. We didn't waste any time. The body was dragged out of the mine and burned, the bones and remains of its victims gathered up for the authorities. The locals were told some half-baked story about a rogue bear, and we were out of there before sunrise. By the time the sun came up, the town was already moving on, the horror of the past few weeks buried along with the ashes of the creature that had caused it. Back at base, the debrief was short. Another mission completed, another threat neutralized. The higher-ups were satisfied, and we were given a few days to recuperate before the next assignment. As I sat there, staring at the stitches in my side, I couldn't help but think about how close I'd come to ending up like Logan. Just another casualty in a war that most people didn't even know was being fought. But I wasn't dead. Not yet. And as long as I'm still breathing, I'll be out there, doing what needs to be done. There are more of these things out there, and it's my job to make sure they don't get the chance to do to anyone else what they did to Logan. So I'll keep going, one mission at a time until I can't anymore. I was staring at the remnants of my morning coffee when the call came in. The mug, chipped around the rim, sat on the cluttered desk of my one-bedroom apartment in Fargo, North Dakota, a city that had the dual curse of bone-chilling winters and an uncanny knack for attracting strange occurrences. My name is Nathaniel Carter, and I've been with the unit for about ten years now, although I've stopped keeping track of time. The unit, short for the U.S. government's Cryptid Containment Division, isn't something you'll find in any official records. We deal with the things that defy explanation, the kinds of creatures that shouldn't exist but do. The assignment that came in that morning wasn't anything out of the ordinary, at least not for me. A series of disappearances had occurred in the dense forests near Lake Metigoshi, a place that had always had its fair share of local legends most of which we, in the unit, knew to be more than just stories. But what set this apart was the escalation. The local authorities had found remains this time, and the nature of the injuries suggested something far beyond the capabilities of any known predator. I packed up my gear, including the usual assortment of firearms and silver-coated blades, and headed out in my old pickup truck. The drive to the site took about four hours, plenty of time to go over the details in my head. There was something unsettling about this case, something that gnawed at the edges of my thoughts. The reports mentioned bodies that had been torn apart with such force that bones were found splintered, embedded in tree trunks like grotesque decorations. But it wasn't just the brutality, it was the precision. This wasn't a wild animal attack, it was deliberate, almost methodical. When I arrived, the local sheriff, a grizzled man named Murdoch with a face carved by years of exposure to harsh weather, met me at the entrance to the forest. His expression told me everything I needed to know. He'd seen things out here that he couldn't reconcile with his understanding of the world. They're out there, Murdoch said, his voice low. We found three bodies so far, but there's no pattern to where they're being left. It's like whatever's doing, this is playing with us. I nodded, not saying much. Over the years, I'd learned that it was best to let these small-town lawmen talk. They needed to get the weight off their chests, 
even if I couldn't tell them the full truth about what they were dealing with. The forest was dense, the trees standing like sentinels against the bright sky. The air was thick with the scent of pine and the faint, acrid tang of decay. I followed Murdoch and his deputies into the woods, my hand resting on the grip of my revolver. The deeper we went, the more the forest seemed to close in around us, the undergrowth becoming almost impassable. We found the first body near a stream, or rather, what was left of it. The sight was enough to turn the stomach of even the most hardened deputies. The corpse had been eviscerated, its chest cavity ripped open as if something had torn through it to get at the organs within. The skin around the wounds was shredded, hanging in strips that fluttered in the light breeze. It's like a damn bear got at him, one of the deputies muttered, his face pale. But it wasn't a bear. Bears don't dismember bodies like this, don't strip flesh with surgical precision. I crouched next to the remains, examining the torn edges of the skin, the splintered bones. There were deep gouges, too, that I recognized from other cases, marks left by claws far sharper and stronger than anything nature was supposed to produce. Murdoch, I said, standing up. Tell your men to stay back. Whatever did this is still around. He nodded grimly, ordering the deputies to fan out and secure the perimeter. They were good men, I could tell, but they were out of their depth. This was my world, one where the monsters in the dark were all too real. As I moved deeper into the woods, the sense of unease grew stronger. The forest seemed to thrum with an unnatural energy, as if the very air was charged with something malignant. The trees were thicker here, their branches intertwined like the gnarled fingers of ancient withered hands. I'd seen places like this before, sites where the veil between our world and something else had worn thin. I found the second body tangled in the roots of a massive oak. The man had been pinned to the ground, his limbs twisted at impossible angles, but it was the expression on his face that caught my attention, a look of sheer, uncomprehending terror. He had seen what was coming for him, and he hadn't stood a chance. I was about to radio Murdoch when I heard it, a low, rhythmic clicking sound like the grinding of stone on stone. It was coming from deeper in the forest, and it was moving closer. I ducked behind a tree, drawing my revolver and cocking the hammer. The clicking grew louder, more insistent, and then I saw it. It moved through the trees with a fluidity that belied its size, its long, spindly limbs ending in wickedly curved claws. Its body was covered in a matted, wiry fur that bristled as it moved, and its face, if you could call it that was an elongated, twisted thing, with a jaw that seemed to unhinge like a snake's. It was a nightmare given form, something that shouldn't exist in the waking world. I fired off two shots, the sound cracking through the stillness of the forest like thunder. The creature let out a hideous, chittering screech as the bullet struck it, but it didn't go down. Instead, it charged, moving faster than I could have imagined, its claws flashing as it slashed at me. I barely managed to throw myself to the side, the claws missing my face by inches. Rolling to my feet, I fired again, aiming for its chest this time. The creature staggered but kept coming, its eyes, or the empty pits where eyes should have been, fixed on me with an intelligence that was all the more terrifying for its alien nature. It lunged at me, its claws outstretched, and I braced myself for the impact. But then, with a speed that defied logic, it twisted in mid-air as if struck by an invisible force and collapsed to the ground, twitching violently. I didn't waste time. I ran over to it, firing the remaining rounds into its head, ensuring it was dead. The creature's body convulsed one last time, then lay still, its twisted form crumpled like a broken doll. Whatever it had been, it was no longer a threat. Murdoch and his deputies arrived minutes later, guns drawn, but the danger had passed. They stared at the creature's corpse with a mixture of horror and disbelief. What the hell is that thing? One of the deputies asked, his voice shaking. Classified, I replied, holstering my revolver. Get the area secured. No one comes in or out until we've cleaned this up. Murdoch nodded, his face pale but determined. He didn't ask any more questions, 
and I didn't offer any answers. This was the kind of thing that didn't get explained to the public, the kind of thing that got buried in official reports that never saw the light of day. As I walked back to my truck, the adrenaline began to wear off, replaced by a cold, gnawing exhaustion. This was just another day in the unit, another monster slain, another mystery buried. But the thought that lingered in the back of my mind was this. How many more of these things were out there, lurking in the dark corners of the world? I reached into my jacket pocket and pulled out a crumpled pack of cigarettes, lighting one as I leaned against the hood of my truck. The first drag did little to calm my nerves, but it was a familiar ritual, something to ground me after the chaos. Murdoch approached, his boots crunching on the gravel. He stopped a few feet away, looking like he wanted to say something but not quite knowing how. Thanks for your help, Carter, he said finally, his voice quiet. I don't know what we would have done without you. Just doing my job, I replied, exhaling a stream of smoke into the crisp air. He nodded, understanding that the conversation was over. As he turned to leave, I crushed the cigarette under my boot and climbed into the truck. The engine roared to life, and I drove away from the scene, the weight of another encounter heavy on my shoulders. But I didn't dwell on it. In this line of work, you couldn't afford to. There was always another mission, another monster waiting to be dealt with, and I'd be ready for it when the time came. It was the kind of place where you could hear your own heartbeat. That's what I hated about the job, the silence of it all. Sure, there were the obvious perks. The salary was great and the benefits were better than most government gigs. But the job itself? Well, it's the sort of thing that makes you wish for a normal life. One where you're not tracking things that shouldn't exist. Things you're told don't exist. My name is Cal Mercer and I've been with the Department of Cryptid Containment for just over six years. Six years of hunting down things that most people only talk about around campfires or in late-night horror movie marathons. I wasn't always in this line of work, though. I started out as a biology professor at a small college in Vermont. I had a quiet life, filled with the kind of routine that would bore most people to tears, but I loved it. Then, one winter night, I saw something in the woods near my home, something that shouldn't have been there, something that changed everything. You see, once you've seen what's out there, the government likes to make sure you don't talk. They gave me two options, join the team or disappear. So here I am, doing things I never imagined, and on some days, it feels like I'm on the edge of losing my mind. The latest assignment brought me to a remote part of New Mexico somewhere out in the desert where the land stretched on for miles with nothing but scrub and rock. A small town named San Orfeo was where we set up shop, though calling it a town was generous. More like a forgotten crossroads where people only stopped if they had no other choice. We were chasing reports of something killing livestock and recently a couple of hikers who had gone missing. The locals were scared, though none of them would admit it outright but I could see it in their eyes, the way they looked over their shoulders as if expecting something to leap out of the shadows at any moment. I was partnered with Jacob Tully, a guy I'd worked with a few times before. He was quiet, methodical, and had a tendency to chew tobacco that made his already gravelly voice even more guttural. We were sitting in the local diner, pretending to be out-of-towners on a hunting trip while we eavesdropped on the locals. That's how we usually worked blend in, listen, and pick up on the details that the official reports miss. The waitress, a woman who looked to be in her late forties with tired eyes and a nervous smile, kept glancing at us like she wanted to say something. I could tell she knew more than she was letting on. Something bothering you, miss? I asked casually, pouring another packet of sugar into my coffee. Tully didn't look up from his menu, but I knew he was listening intently. She hesitated, wiping her hands on her apron. You boys really here to hunt? I nodded. That's right. Heard there's been some trouble around these parts. 
Figure we might try our luck, see what's out there. She leaned in a little closer, lowering her voice. If you're smart, you'll get back in your car and leave. There's things out in that desert that shouldn't be disturbed. They say it's been here longer than any of us, something old and hungry. What kind of thing? Tully finally spoke, his eyes meeting hers. She flinched a little at the intensity of his gaze. Can't say for sure. People who've seen it up close... Well, they don't come back to tell the tale. We exchanged a look. That was our cue. After a few more pleasantries, we left the diner and headed to the town's outskirts, where the missing hikers had last been seen. The sun was low, casting long shadows across the desert, and the wind carried a chill that had nothing to do with the temperature. We parked our truck near a stand of Joshua trees and hiked into the rocky terrain, our gear strapped to our backs. As the light faded, we made camp and set up motion sensors and infrared cameras around the perimeter. Tully was checking the feeds while I stood on a small rise, scanning the horizon with my binoculars. The sense of unease I'd felt earlier was growing, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. Not by anything human, though. No. This was something else. Something that didn't belong. The first sign of trouble came just after midnight. The motion sensors went off, one after another, in rapid succession. Tully and I grabbed our rifles and night vision goggles, scanning the area for any sign of movement. The desert was eerily still, the only sound the soft hiss of the wind through the rocks. Then we saw it, a shape moving low to the ground, skirting the edge of our camp. It was fast, too fast for anything I'd ever seen in the wild. It looked like a cross between a lizard and a wolf, but its limbs were too long, its body too sinewy, and the way it moved was all wrong, like it was sliding over the ground rather than walking. Tully aimed his rifle and fired. The shot echoed across the desert, but the thing didn't even flinch. It darted into the darkness, out of sight before I could get a clear look at it. Damn it. Tully muttered, lowering his rifle. Didn't even slow it down. Whatever it is, it's not natural, I said, my voice steady despite the adrenaline pumping through my veins. Let's fall back, regroup. We need to figure out what we're dealing with. We retreated to the truck, locking ourselves inside while we reviewed the footage from the cameras. What we saw made my blood run cold. The creature had circled our camp multiple times, studying us, waiting for the right moment to strike. And it wasn't alone. There were at least three others, moving in perfect unison, their eyes glowing faintly in the night. This isn't just some cryptid, Tully said, his voice grim. This is a pack, and they're hunting us. We had faced dangerous creatures before, Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest, the Jersey Devil in the Pine Barrens, but nothing like this. These things were coordinated, intelligent, and far more dangerous than anything we'd encountered. We need to get out of here, I said, starting the engine. Warn the town, get some backup. But as I turned the key, the engine sputtered and died. I tried again, and again, but the truck wouldn't start. Damn it, I cursed, slamming my fist on the steering wheel. It's like they knew... Before I could finish... Something slammed into the side of the truck, rocking it on its wheels. Tully raised his rifle, aiming out the window, but there was nothing there. Then the creature appeared on the hood, its massive claws scraping against the glass. It was even bigger up close, its scales shimmering in the moonlight, and its mouth full of sharp, jagged teeth that looked like they could tear through steel. I didn't think, just reacted, pulling my pistol from my holster and firing through the windshield. The creature shrieked, a high-pitched sound that rattled my bones. But it didn't retreat. It clawed at the glass, cracked spider-webbing across the surface. We need to move, Tully shouted, kicking open the door on his side and jumping out. I followed, the two of us firing at the creature as we scrambled away from the truck. It followed, relentless, as if it knew it was just a matter of time before we ran out of options. Tully tried to lead it away, firing in short bursts to keep it distracted, but I knew we were running out of time. There was no way we could outrun it, 
not on foot, and our weapons weren't doing enough damage to slow it down. Cal, over here! Tully called, motioning toward a crevice in the rocks. It was narrow, just wide enough for us to squeeze through, but it might give us a chance to escape. We scrambled into the crevice, the creature snapping at our heels. The rocks tore at my clothes, leaving deep scratches in my skin, but I pushed through, desperate to get away. We reached a small cave at the end of the crevice, barely big enough to stand in. The creature clawed at the entrance, but it couldn't fit through the narrow gap. For a moment, we were safe, but I knew it wouldn't last. The creature was persistent, and it was only a matter of time before it found another way in or called its pack. We're trapped, Tully said, his voice hoarse from the exertion. No way out. I looked around the cave, searching for anything we could use. There was nothing, just rocks and dirt, and the oppressive darkness pressing in on us. Then I remembered the dynamite we'd brought along, just in case. We might have one last shot, I said, pulling the sticks of dynamite from my pack. If we can collapse the entrance, maybe we can trap it in here. Tully nodded, understanding immediately. We set the charges, lighting the fuse as the creature continued to claw at the entrance. It was so close now I could feel the heat of its breath, hear the rasping sound of its lungs as it tried to force its way in. Run! I shouted, grabbing Tully's arm and dragging him out of the cave, back through the crevice as fast as we could go. The dynamite exploded behind us, the shockwave knocking us off our feet and sending a cloud of dust and debris into the air. When the dust settled, I looked back at the cave. The entrance was gone, buried under tons of rock. There was no sign of the creature, no sound except the ringing in my ears. We did it, Tully said, his voice shaky with relief. Yeah, I replied, though I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't over. Creatures like that don't just appear out of nowhere, and they don't hunt alone. As we made our way back to the truck, I couldn't help but think about what the waitress had said. Something old and hungry. Maybe we'd stopped it, maybe not. But one thing was certain. This wouldn't be the last time something like this happened. Back in the truck, I tried the engine one last time, and this time, it roared to life. We drove back to San Orfeo in silence the reality of what we'd faced sinking in. When we got back to town, the sheriff met us at the edge of town. I told him what had happened, showed him the video footage we'd captured. He believed us, which was a rare thing in our line of work. He promised to send a team out to secure the area, but I knew it wouldn't be enough. As we drove away from San Orfeo, I glanced back one last time. The desert stretched out before us, endless and empty. But I knew better. There were things out there, things that weren't meant to be found, and as long as they existed, so would people like me. The engine hummed steadily as we sped down the highway, leaving the desert behind, but not the memories 